hello and welcome back for another Sheriff Asodium video. It's time once again to answer more of your questions, this time about letters of intent and post-interview communication. As always, these are real questions from real readers and viewers and social media direct messengers and random folks who get a hold of my email somehow. Let's get into it. The first question, which is the most common question I get every January is, should I send a letter of intent? And really, this is a question about strategy. And if you've listened to my videos on preference signaling or others where this kind of strategic topic comes up, you know the framework to answer this question. The best way to answer any kind of strategic question is to put yourself in the program director's shoes. Ask yourself, how's a program director going to see it if I do this thing or, or if I do this other thing? And if you put yourself in the shoes of the program director, why? Why would receiving a letter of intent help you? Why would that matter to you? And you can make two very good arguments that it won't matter and that it shouldn't matter. The first is this. Suppose that you're the program director and this applicant, let's call her applicant A, she sends you a letter of intent and says, hey boss, I'm ranking your program number one. Well, that's cool, but um, you already made your rank order list and using whatever process your program uses to rank the quality of her application and her interview, you already put her at number 11 on your rank order list. So should you move her up just because she says she's going to rank your program number one? I mean, you could say, ah, well, you know, she's ranking us number one, so I'm going to forget about whatever I thought when I was looking at her heiress application and talking with her on her interview day, and I'm going to move her up to, um, I, I don't know, number five. But the risk of doing that should be obvious. I mean, the risk of doing that is that you might actually match this person, and you might match her instead of applicants that you honestly would have rather matched. So for program directors, if you trust the applicant rating process that you have, the optimal strategy for you is just to, to thank applicant A for her interest and then sit back and let the match algorithm do the work because if you do that, you're assured that you're going to get your best possible result according to the rankings that you created and assigned. The second reason that you could argue that a program director shouldn't or wouldn't be influenced by letters of intent has to do with equity. And that's become a much more important consideration in residency selection over the past decade or so, especially at some of the biggest and most famous academic programs. Many programs these days are going to great lengths to do things that they believe promote equity or reduce bias in residency selection. Application reviewers might be blinded to the applicant's heiress photo, for instance, or uh, they might be blinded to their need for a work visa. Uh, or interviewers might be blinded to USMLE scores so that that doesn't factor into and influence their perception of the applicant's personal qualities. Um, or interviewers might be required to use a standard list of questions so they don't just, um, you know, rate the applicant favorably because they're chit-chatting and, and they find out they both went to the same ski resort in Vail. So if you take the time and effort to construct a process that you think improves equity and you generate applicant ratings like these here, well, you really shouldn't change them because of things outside that process. And in fact, I'm aware of some big name institutions that have a policy against doing that very thing. They say, once you set the rank order list, it is set. Uh, because most of the things that you might do after the list is set, uh, they would probably introduce bias or favoritism, or they would work against diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some of you may have interviewed at programs like this, where after your interview day, you got a, a message from the program saying, thanks for interviewing with us. We have all the information we need. There's no need to communicate with us. We don't plan on communicating with you either. And if you get that kind of message, they're trying to tell you not to send a letter of intent. And they're strongly suggesting that if you do, it won't matter. And partner, if they tell you that, I'd take them at their word. I would not shoot off any letter of intent email uh, unless you just like shooting blanks. But there are still two reasons that a program director might be influenced by letters of intent. One of them is a good reason, and one of them is a not so good reason. And when you understand those reasons, then it helps you understand why some programs might change your ranking in response to a letter of intent, and it should help you understand how you should frame that letter. The not so good reason is this. Some program directors have the misfortune of working at an institution where the GME dean is a clown. 
And instead of using their eyes and their ears and higher cognitive processes to understand the nature of the world around them, they want everything to be metric driven so they can plot little control charts and show continuous quality improvement in whatever metric they're chasing, regardless of whether that metric actually tells you anything useful about the actual world in which we live or not. And unfortunately, there's a number of these clown GME deans that like to track the number of ranks you needed to fill each of the institution's residency programs. Because if you take that number and then you divide it by the number of residency positions that, that the program was trying to fill, well, now, now you get a nice number that you can use to compare your, say, your anesthesiology program to your internal medicine program and see who's best. And then you can set an arbitrary goal for how much the bad program needs to improve next year. Um, and you can justify a certain portion of your staff's FTE as they generate these cool looking quality reports that you can show to your own metric chasing senior dean who will then smile and nod his head and tell you what a good job you're doing. And what should be entirely obvious for anyone who has more than a passing interest in residency selection is that it's a whole lot easier to fill certain residency programs than others. If you're the dermatology program director, uh, it's a lot easier to fill your program than if you're the family medicine program director. And I say that not to insult all the hardworking dermatology PDs out there who are doing the Lord's work and filling their programs every year. I'm just saying that uh, you don't have to do anything heroic to fill those positions. It's a buyer's market. Now, you got to figure out whether you want the applicant with a 265 on Step 2CK and 10 first author publications, or the applicant with a 270 on Step 2CK and five first author publications. But if you're the family medicine PD, well, you've got to contend with the fact that perhaps up to 50% of your applicant pool is applying to family medicine as a backup and would actually prefer to match in a different specialty altogether. So you're competing with a much broader field of programs to try to fill the positions in your own. Now, the NRMP actually tracks how many ranks it takes on average to fill residency programs in different specialties. So there's really no excuse for any dean to be unaware of this. And yet here we are where the problem that I'm describing remains an ongoing issue. Now, this is how those NRMP data looked for last year's match. So on average, a dermatology or interventional radiology program needed to rank only four applicants or so to fill each of their positions. So you have a program of, of two residents a year, you only needed to rank eight people. Now, a radiology program needed 5.5 positions for each of the spots that they were trying to fill. An internal medicine program needed 6.9. Family medicine needed 7.9. And in last year's match, pediatrics, emergency medicine, and radiation oncology all needed more than nine ranked applicants to fill each of the positions they were trying to fill. And that's assuming that those programs even filled at all. So if you're a program director in one of those specialties, one of the specialties on the right side of this chart, well, the way you can make yourself look real good to your foolish metric chasing dean is by changing your rank order list so that you put the applicants who rank you highly at the very top of your list, regardless of whether you actually like those applicants very much or not. But if you do that, you see, you'll get a nice short match run and you can stay off the dean's naughty list and you can avoid having to do a root cause analysis or, or write up an action plan to explain how you're going to address the fact that you had a long match run. But the second reason, the, the good and logically defensible reason why a program director might change an applicant's ranking on the basis of receiving a letter of intent is that they believe that desire to be at the program actually makes the applicant more desirable. I mean, residency is hard. The days are long. You're going to get challenged physically and emotionally and mentally. And I think it's completely reasonable to believe as a program director that you're going to get farther training a resident who's actually excited to be at your program. If you get someone who shows up on day one with a little hop in their step because they're living their dream, you can probably teach them more and get them farther than, than someone who turns up with a, a hangdog look on their face because they wanted to be at a program with a higher U.S. News and World Report ranking or in a cooler city or a place closer to their family or significant other. And if this is how you feel, then if an applicant sends you a letter of intent, then you actually should change the applicant's rating and move them up your rank order list. It makes perfect sense to do that. Now, when you understand this, that tells you something about what your letter of intent ought to communicate 
if you want it to be impactful in this particular scenario. Beyond just saying the program's your number one, what you want is a letter that communicates genuine excitement and enthusiasm for training in that area and at that program and with those people. But I've been talking for a while now, and I still haven't answered the very simple question that we started with, which was, should I send a letter of intent? And at this point, I've given you two reasons why a program director might be completely uninfluenced by a letter of intent, and I've given you two reasons why they might. So if you're the applicant, what do you do? Which of these reasons, which of these wins out in the end? And it turns out there are some data on this. There are actually a number of papers where program directors have been surveyed in one way or another. And actually, in a few of those papers, the program directors say, no, I'm not influenced by letters of intent. Here's, here's a paper from Otolaryngology where exactly zero program directors said that a letter of intent impacted their rank order list. But there are other papers that have different results. The best case, the most optimistic scenario that I've seen probably comes from this very recent paper in which 28% of general surgery program directors said that letters of intent influenced an applicant's rank order list position. Now you gotta remember, all these data, they're survey data, and there's different response rates, and, and people choose to answer the survey for different reasons, and the items are phrased in different ways. And even then, some people are influenced by things that they say they're not influenced by. Uh, you know, if you do a survey of doctors meeting with pharmaceutical reps uh, and say, how often does that change your practice pattern? They're going to say, oh, it doesn't change. But the fact that the drug reps keep coming back shows you that the drug company knows something that you don't or at least something you're not willing to admit to in a survey. Um, still, my intuition is that the actual number of program directors who, is in, who are influenced by letters of intent, I, I think it's between these two estimates, and it's probably closer to the 28%. So if a program is truly your number one, and they didn't tell you not to communicate with them, then you really have nothing to lose by telling them that, and, um, and it might actually help you. All right, next question. Should I send a letter of interest? Now, there's a distinction here between a letter of intent, where you say you're going to rank the program number one, and a letter of interest, which is where you say something short of that. Thing is, program directors are not dumb. They've been around the block a time or two. If you say that you're ranking their program number one, that is clear and unambiguous, and they know exactly what you mean. But if you tell them, I think your program is swell, and I plan to rank it very highly, they don't, they don't really know what that means. Actually, they know that they're not your number one, um, but that you're planning to rank their program somewhere. So let's analyze this by putting yourself again in the program director's shoes. Does knowing that information, that your program is somewhere between number two and number 15 or whatever, does that information really help you? I, I would say almost certainly not. And actually, actually, it's possible that it could hurt you if the program thought that you were going to rank them number one, because now you've told them in so many words that they're at best number two. Bottom line, for me, no, I would not waste any time sending unsolicited letters of interest. Next question, should I send multiple letters of intent? And here I'm going to answer this question two ways. The first way I'm going to answer it is from a purely analytic standpoint, because if you look at residency selection from a pure analytic standpoint, then maybe you should send a letter of intent to every program that you're ranking, because like we discussed, it could help you. It won't help you at most programs, but at some programs it might, and on the margins, that could be the difference between matching and not matching, even though you know, you'd be lying to most of the programs that you send these letters to. And actually, if you're interested in game theory, there is a rich and fascinating literature on the strategy behind lying and cheating. Lying and cheating help you win. So in many cases, it can become the dominant strategy, kind of like uh, putting an X in the middle of a tic-tac-toe board on your first move. When you do that, it doesn't guarantee that you'll win, but it's the one move that gives you the highest expected value for the outcome of the game. So what keeps lying and cheating in check are the punishments that get imposed for it. Because if there's a reasonable chance that you're lying or your cheating is going to get detected, 
and if it's detected you get a punishment that leads to a worse outcome than what you would have gotten if you just played by the rules well now the expected value of cheating becomes less than the expected value of playing fair and playing fair becomes the dominant strategy now some games in life have multiple rounds you know if, if you're playing one round of poker and you bluff you might be able to win the game even if you get a bad hand you push all your chips to the center of the table and uh, and you scare everybody else off. But if you play more than one round of cards, then the other players at the table are quickly going to realize that you don't have an all-in kind of hand every single time the cards get dealt. And they're going to punish you by refusing to fold, and they're going to win back and take away all your money. But if you were playing just one hand of poker, well, bluffing has got to be the dominant strategy because lying in that way gives you a chance of winning regardless of the quality of the hands that you're dealt and and in most ways for most applicants the match is a one round game so maybe maybe lying to programs and sending letters to everyone saying you're ranking them number one maybe that is the dominant strategy to decide if it is or if it isn't it really requires looking at whether you could be punished in that one round or not so again, if we're looking at this through a pure analytic standpoint, no moralization at all, we got to analyze first, what are the odds that you're going to get caught? Are programs going to know that you did this? And here the answer is, unless you go unmatched or unless you match at your last choice, then yes, programs will at least have the opportunity to know that you lied. If a program took 180 positions to fill the program and they had you ranked at number 100, well, they know that you would have matched with them if your communication had been honest. Now, maybe the program forgets that you emailed them, uh, or maybe they don't even look at their rank order list after match day. But the point is, they have the opportunity to know that they were lied to. So the next question becomes, if someone realizes that I lied to them, what's the punishment going to be? Uh, because if all it does is just generate a little frown on the program director's face and then they forget about it and move on, then lying and telling every program that they're your number one, it still is probably going to be the dominant strategy. And being truthful, in all likelihood, that's exactly all that will happen. The program director who notices that you lied to them and said that you were they were your number one when they actually weren't that person will in all probability do nothing with that information beyond looking at your name and thinking that you're kind of a chud but i have heard of some cases where the program director emailed the dean of the applicant's medical school and that ultimately resulted in a stern talking to for the student but it's still hard to imagine that a school would impose any real sanction on a student for sending multiple letters of intent Especially because, you know, even though it's unsavory, a school is going to have to be pushed pretty hard to do something that would claw back a successful match for one of their students. And the simple reason why is that doing that kind of stuff is not in the school's long-term best interests. Now, it's also possible, though, that an upset program director, they could complain to the program that you did match to. Many applicants don't realize this, but after the match, the program receives a list from the NRMP that shows all the applicants that they ranked and where they, all their ranked applicants ultimately matched. And many program directors, you know, they know each other. So it's possible that they could send a quick email to your new program director. And that is obviously not the first impression you want to make with the person who's going to control your life for the next three to seven years. But still, even if that occurred, I still don't know that there's much risk beyond the reputational damage. I don't think very many programs are going to want to try to fight to break their match commitment and then have to scramble to fill an unfilled position now because they got an email from a colleague that was irritated. Um, and again, the simple reason is that doing that would not be in the program's self-interest. However, it is also possible that one of the programs that you lied to could complain to the NRMP. This is the NRMP's Code of Conduct for Applicants, which has a section entitled Limit Post-Interview Communication. And that section acknowledges that during the recruiting season, applicants may not have adequate time to obtain the information needed to make informed decisions about ranking programs, and they may wish to clarify information following interviews. So it's not against match rules to engage in post-interview communication. 
However, although applicants may request and exchange clarifying information with programs following the interview, they must not solicit or exchange in post-interview communication for the purposes of influencing or ascertaining a program's ranking intentions. So it is possible that if someone complained to the NRMP, it could set in motion a process that would ultimately result in a match violation. And that would clearly be a devastating outcome for the applicant. Now, I think that's still not especially likely to occur. Complaining to the NRMP would be the nuclear option for a program director who got mad that you fibbed to them um, because it's going to open up a whole bureaucratic can of worms. And it's likely to get one of their colleagues mad at them because the other program is probably not going to appreciate that someone outside that program is, is throwing their match results into turmoil. Kind of seems like sore loser behavior. Um, even though it could be cloaked in the argument that, you know, we need physicians to be of the highest ethical standards and, and this kind of fibbing is really a crime against the house of medicine as a whole. But if you did get written up for a match violation, uh, it would certainly be unpleasant, um, even though you might still be able to get out of it because the NRMP would still have to conclude based on the preponderance of the evidence that the applicant was communicating for the purposes of influencing the program's ranking intentions. And that may be hard to do because, I mean, if the applicant says, well, you know, I, I, I just changed my mind about my number one after I sent the email and I, and I didn't want to send another one saying you're number two. Or maybe they'll just claim with a straight face that, you know, their emails uh, that were all sent at the exact same time, they, they had absolutely no intention whatsoever of influencing the program's ranking. You know, they're just like a really open person, dude, and they just say whatever's on their mind at the time. So from a purely analytic standpoint, if you send multiple letters of intent, there is probably a small probability that it helps you a little bit. But there's also an even smaller smaller but non-zero probability that you're going to get the death penalty and you're going to get racked up for a match violation. So simply from a pure analytic standpoint, I think the answer to this question is no. But if you've watched these mailbag videos before, you've probably heard me say that when I answer your questions, I don't necessarily just do it from an analytic standpoint. When I answer your questions, I try to put myself in your shoes and I try to answer with what I honestly think would be the best thing to do if I were in that situation. And from that standpoint, my answer is an even more emphatic no. And I say that because um, I got a little gray hair now. I actually have a little bit more than a little bit of gray hair. And um, in your life and in your career in medicine, you're gonna win some things, you're gonna lose some things. And not matching or not matching into the program that you thought you wanted to go to, it is, it's a loss. It's a big loss. And losing always sucks. But one thing that makes it suck less is feeling like you've been true to yourself. And uh, in my life, I've had my share of losses. Things that, um, times that I, I got passed over for something, an opportunity that I thought I wanted, uh, but I didn't get it. And, um, but as a matter of principle, I, I don't want to try to present myself as something that I'm not. I want to stay true to my principles and I want to be honest about who I am and what I'm about. And part of that is saying what I mean, whether that's what you wanted to hear or not. If you get good at playing the game, if you dance every time someone tells you to dance, you, you may make up more opportunities for yourself, but um, I'm not sure that you'll be as pleased with yourself in the end. So my advice from both an analytic and a personal standpoint is no, don't do this. All right, final question. Now we're getting into programs communicating with applicants. A program told me I'm ranked to match. Should I rethink my rank order list? And here, once again, the answer is a resounding no. Everyone needs to understand how the NRMP matching algorithm works. And if you don't understand that, there is an excellent video on the NRMP's website that I'll link to in the notes below. And there's actually a couple of just simply outstanding videos on the Sheriff of Sodium YouTube channel on how the current matching algorithm came to be and about the unsung heroes of medicine who put themselves at risk to get a matching algorithm that optimized applicant outcomes. And if you haven't seen those videos, I'm going to also link to them. But the bottom line is the way the matching algorithm works is by going through each applicant's rank order list and trying to match them to that program. If their top program has them ranked, they get a provisional match at that top program. And the only way they lose it, the only way they get displaced, is if that program fills with applicants that the program has ranked more highly. 
And when that occurs, then the algorithm just goes on to the applicant's number two program and tries to place them there and so on. So there is no value in ranking programs in anything other than the actual order in which you would want to match at them. If you put a program that you don't like that much on top of your rank order list, just because the PD sent you a message saying that you were ranked to match, you just played yourself. If you're really ranked to match at that program, then you'll displace other applicants whenever it's that program's turn on your rank order list, and you'll match there. But you'd only match there if you didn't match at your real top choices. Now, some of you may be saying, yeah, yeah, but, but what about you said before about how you know, residency is hard and all, and how programs want to train residents who want to be there? I mean, doesn't that apply to applicants too? Shouldn't I want to go to a, a program where the program director wants me? And I, I think, yeah, that is true. And if a program tells you, if they tell you, you know, I, I really think you do very well in our program, or I think your skill set and career goals match up so well with the unique opportunities we have at this program, or, or if you just get a really good feeling that, you know, you vibe with the program director and they really want to train you, well, I think those things should uh, legitimately factor into your program ranking. But if all we're talking about is an email from a program that says you're ranked to match, I'm not so sure that that conveys excitement about having you in the program. It may simply convey desperation or worry about not filling the program. And, and anyhow, the phrase ranked to match is somewhat ambiguous. I mean, if you read that and you, you want it to mean that they have you ranked highly enough that if you rank them number one, you will match there, uh, that you can't be displaced by other applicants. But it's not completely certain that it actually means that. And, and in fact, some unscrupulous programs use this as a smokescreen, and they say it to many applicants, and it means simply that we have you ranked, and you're ranked in a position that you know we think might match with us. Uh, but if you don't match, well, you know, hey, we didn't mean you were necessarily going to match here. You know, our program was just really hot this year, and you ended up being below the cut. So I wouldn't base your decision on just an email uh, conveying something like that. You should also be aware that the program might be committing a match violation. There's a code of conduct for programs too, and the, the language is similar to the code for applicants. Programs must not solicit or require post-interview communication for the purposes of influencing applicants' ranking preferences. Now, for reasons that are entirely understandable, few applicants are willing to take aim at a program that does this and turn in that program for a match violation. But this kind of stuff isn't supposed to occur. So if you're the applicant, you're going to have to decide what you want to do with it. My strong advice is to not let it influence your own decision making. But if we want this kind of stuff from programs not to occur, um, I think we have to use the same kind of analysis that we did when we were considering it from the applicant standpoint a few moments ago. I mean, like we discussed for applicants, the match is a one round game. So we have to have a way of punishing lying in that one round. And I think a match violation is a sensible way of doing that. It obviously doesn't keep all applicants from fibbing, but the small probability of a career-ending punishment is enough of a deterrent that it maintains an equilibrium in the market about how many applicants are willing to lie and how bold their lies are going to be. But because of the power differential between programs and applicants, I don't think we can really rely on match violations to get to that same equilibrium for programs. The probabilities are just too low. I mean, what, I'm, what I mean is that the probability that an applicant would be so bold as to turn in a program, and then the probability that the NRMP would then seriously sanction a program that was turned in, I think those probabilities are so low that even though the punishment is severe, the expected value calculus doesn't change. It still is better to fib in this way to applicants. But there are other things that might work uh, because for programs, the match is not a one round game. It's a multiple round game. They're sitting at the poker table for multiple hands. And so you have the possibility of imposing punishments that occur not right this minute, but sometime in the future. And actually, this is the way that markets work to maintain honest buyers and sellers. You know, if you're a merchant and you're uh, in the marketplace selling worthless goods, or if you're a buyer and you're taking some merchant's valuable goods on credit and then you're not paying for them, guess what? 
people stop doing business with you and you suffer in subsequent rounds. The key thing though, is that we have to give buyers and sellers the information that they need to decide who to do business with. And I think we could do the same thing with residency programs. Uh, hint, hint, if someone had the inclination to expand the Reddit name and shame thread that gets published after every match day, uh, you know, the one where applicants anonymously share the names of programs that, that did them dirty, uh, and then you make that list into a website that's um, search engine optimized, it could provide a more realistic deterrent for programs to curtail this behavior. And folks, that's all I've got. Keep those questions coming, and as always, Thanks for listening.